Welcome to the Agile People FikaCast. We talk about how to navigate with agility in our organizations. So, welcome to the Agile People Fika. This is a uh, podcast or a, a coffee talk where we uh, share some thoughts about our latest learnings. Today we will talk about agility in finance. If you have been following us, we uh, we took a training last week and uh, now it's one week later and Anders and I, we were thinking maybe we need to remind ourselves about what did we actually learn? What was the big takeaways for us um, uh, from this training? And uh, both of us, we have been working in uh, organization, uh, organizations where we would deliver different ways of uh, build an agile organization and deliver in, in an agile way. Uh, so here we have some good coin drops about the financial management system that is maybe working against things because it's very traditional. And uh, in the training, we we started to get insights of what we might need to do in our organizations to move to towards a more decoupled organization. And that's the word for me in this training, decouple. So um, let's take it from there. So um, decouple is a word, Anders. What was yes. that about? It is. And I think to start with, I think that the one of the... One of the insights was exactly how much the, the need for financial control caused by a fixed budget, fixed annual budget, um, affects the organizational structure. Um, I felt it many times and seen it, but not as clearly as I did during the education. Mm. And, uh, and for me, it's I've been more thinking previously that, yeah, of course, you if you have a um, um, classical setup with, we see management more or less leading or controlling people in the worst case, uh, then you can't have two big groups. So that builds the hierarchy by itself. But I think seeing it as I did during the education that the financial control is what triggers that to a large extent was a, was a aha moment for me, I think. Mm. And just as you say, with decoupling, I think that another insight was that I've often talked about that the system needs management and we need oh. to, to support and guide and help people about the system as such. And what is that system? And and during the course or in the course, we got the, the term for that, that it's called the management model. The management model we set to, to define how this system behaves more or less. Mm. And for me, that's a matter of, of because we need to have a strategy, which is often lacking. I see that in all companies that you have a strategy, mm. which is a very fussy, high level PowerPoint often. Mm. And there is a big gap between what teams actually do and what it means. So it, it's not it's a disconnect between that high fluffy strategy and the actual work being done. Mm. Um, and I think what we need to do in many companies is to define that management model uh, in a way that um, communicates and leads the work towards the strategy we have defined mm. and do it in the most minimal the minimal possible way to see okay so how do we what what do we need to what kind of information do we need to get to be able to lead the company on a high level reaching our strategy but not micromanaging and that's where i think that this decoupling comes into play so how can we lead but still allow as much autonomy as possible in other parts of the organization mm. yeah i remember when i took the sociocracy training and we were uh, introduced to new ways of uh, organize ourselves more into being a more of a network organization. And uh, it looked really nice, but what that training were a bit lacking is, is what we are talking about, the management model and the financial yeah. model that is uh, to some sense here, or maybe it's 
yeah, it's really hindering that type of setup. So if we decouple it and we create that fantastic peach organization where we have supporting units in the in the middle and customer facing units there outside of that and they are very autonomous to, to each other but they might be able to get support or uh, get aid from, from from different parts the the financial things isn't really expressed well i heard some words about it but i didn't really understand it and how important it is so yeah. that creating that financial autonomy it's uh, it's also the decoupling that we're talking about. Yeah, exactly. And I think we also, one key insight, key learning objective was the need to, to separate these different processes of so targets, forecasting, and resource allocation. Mm. And the way I see it is to, to, to kind of decouple those to get a dynamic and healthy discussion going between the three. Mm. Because otherwise we would end up as being slaves for the financial model, more or less. So we can't really, that is completely hindering agility in that sense. Mm. So even if, and, and I think it that way of seeing the budget also causes a very cost-centered mindset. Mm. So instead of, I took an example last week, I think that I was in a situation where all the, the developers and the, the teams we had saw a huge benefit in, delivering a new feature because that would bring value mm. and there the company or the financial model of the company had this this cost oriented mindset so they just saw the cost and the cost was a bit high but the value mm. was even higher mm. so that it became impossible to to optimize for value in the financial system that the mm. organization had and that is mm. just pure crazy right mm. So if we unlock that and see, okay, so we have this, this is our target and this is our forecast. And yeah, the yeah. looks, forecast looks okay. So we have some room here. So what is the most value bringing thing we can do when we have our basics covered, so to speak? Yeah. I think that is what decoupling these three will bring you the possibility yeah. to actually prioritize and be yeah. dynamic and, and agile. Yeah. That How do you thing. see that? Now I was starting to think of the next thing, and uh, I would like to yeah, introduce okay. that also into into the discussion. And uh, uh, that that was about how you measuring your budget or the the follow up of it. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, I I've heard about this before, but it was really interesting to hear the uh, re cases that we were introduced to in the training that. More or less, you set the budget in the beginning of the year, and one to two months after it's uh, it's committed, it's a bit obsolete. It's the wrong thing, and everyone knows it. But you continue work with it for uh, the whole year, and uh, and then it's the behavior that you also need to fulfill your budget because you have a. Uh, as a manager, maybe you have a bonus attached to the budget, or the fulfilling of the budget, or it could also be that you need to use your budget, otherwise you will not get, not get the same budget the, the, the year after. And, and we saw measurements of what's happening in November, December, that people start to buy stuff just to, uh, to uh, fulfill the budget, so to say. So yeah. from a de delivery perspective for where, where I come, um, it's really interesting to, to say that we decide in January what we should deliver in the end of the year. And in two months, we know that we are, we are building the wrong thing, but we are not mm -hmm. adapting. We are not doing anything about it. We just need to build that thing because it needs to be ready in December, even though it's the wrong thing. So... Putting that into a budget perspective, we need to think differently and we need to iterate the budget all the time. And we need to get rid of this annual annual system that it's uh, it has a connection to. So it should be more of yeah. a rolling thing and it should have new behaviors and new types of approaches to the budget. 
So yeah. that was the third big thing for me in, in this training. So all of these are very obvious, maybe, but it's to, to some sense also a bit radical uh, because many of the things we see in the models we have in budgets or budgeting models that we have today or the uh, controlling uh, mechanisms that we have in the company trades. It's ideas that, that is based on things that we found in 1922, I think was the year, yeah, when, yeah. when this was documented the first time. And we are more or less working the same way in many traditional companies. So it's yeah. uh, kind of fun. And just as you mentioned, it's not only driving this cost-centered mindset uh, instead of the value-based mindset. It also introduced lots of waste well behaviors right with spending mm. a lot at the end of the year to to kind of protect the budget for the next year yeah uh, it's even uh, people even send invoices internally just to to be able to show that they're spent their money mm. um what else did we have people don't dare to spend um in the beginning of the year because they don't know what it looks like at the end of the year and mm. they're also lacking potential values right mm. So it's a system that is based on built to control. Fail. Yeah. Yeah. And built on control that causes lots of bad behaviors, I think. Mm. And then once again, to unlock this, to continuously have a, a healthy dynamics between the targets, the forecast, and the resource mm. allocation. Mm. And yeah, of course, that you need, you need to trust people a bit more, I guess, but it's also a matter of if you have the forecasting and you see that it seems to be okay based on mm. previous year, for instance, mm. then you can have this um, room, how should I say, headroom to be able to maybe you spend a bit more, but it's still not alarmingly much. Mm. Uh, so you don't, you don't interfere with the, uh, with the, uh, the team or the organization that is spending that money until it's really mm. alarming, then maybe you need to go in and check and see, okay, so what's happening here? Why do you overspend compared to previous year, maybe? Mm. Uh, that also comes away a bit from controlling to just following up and see, most mm. likely because we want to trust people, right? They want to do mm. good, and as long as we communicate our strategy and our values and what value is to us, then, mm. of course... The, the the big majority will try to do the best with that, of course. So I mm. think all all want to do good. Mm. The 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 only experience, or the, not the only, but some of the experience I had from this uh, before I took this training was highly connected to the investment we do into features. Maybe we predefine that we should spend an amount of uh, time or effort into a feature. And uh, I can see that it's uh, sometimes hard to get or to help teams to take that responsibility. So if they if they share a thought of how much effort they would like to spend, then it's also that we need to coach them in behavior. So they are also transparent and uh, communicate the progress connected to the spent effort and all that. And uh, because we are, we in all our organizations, we are we're, we're more known to having top down control on this. So if you give the control to the actual development teams um, or delivery teams, they also need to be able to take it and to work with it in, in a healthy way. But I think it's really yeah. important that they are also on board. They should not be decoupled from the from from that financial system and just do things and being stopped or started depending on someone else that is uh, looking at the numbers. They should know the numbers and could take conscious decisions of where should we, where is good enough? Where have we succeeded the value or should we spend more to add nice to have features or should we stop before when we just have the basic functionality? It's, it's highly connected to delivering in an agile way, but you need to put money into that calculation and not just only, yeah. Yeah, just not just only the value we create. We also need to know it's not a charity delivery. It's 
it's actually yeah, a business. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think then it's it's back to having real, if you work in, a, yeah, to have real product owners, if you have that yes. kind of role, right? Yeah. And we yeah. also, the, my conclusion was, and I've stated it before as well, that it's, it's way too uncommon, way too common to have product owners who are not real product owners. They are more mm. technical coordinators, right? Or mm. prioritizing technical stuff. And not mm. they're not empowered enough to take responsibility for the outcome and for the business part. Mm. And is that lack of empowerment due to the financial management model? Or why is it like that? Why is it so common that they are not really product owners? Sure, actually, I think it comes from many places still separate business and IT. So it's a kind of an order from business to IT to deliver mm. something and the requirements that come are on a way to low mm. level. Mm. So you kind of hinder all um, motivation and uh, engagement in the teams because it's mm. already set, right? So it's kind of a water, water scrum fall approach mm. to things. Mm. And maybe that is, I'm not sure. It's a good question, Lonnie. Mm. That's influenced by the financial setup. Mm. Maybe. Maybe it's a topic of its own uh, in a in a conversation. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Mm. Mm. yeah. Any other things that you took with you from last week, except it was a very nice training with uh, people from different parts of the world, all the way from uh, Brazil and uh, uh, from Ireland and uh, Costa Rica, right? From... Sorry, Costa Rica as well, right? Costa Rica as well, yes, yeah, yeah, and Austria and um, yeah, many Austria. places. Really yeah, many, inspiring yeah. session. I yeah, I enjoyed the education very much. Yeah, I think it put it put words to many thoughts, many things I've talked about in, in mm. my assignments and my previous mm. jobs, and put new new a new angle on it that was really mm. fruitful for me yeah and also um it was the first face-to-face -face training i had uh since before covid and that was also a nice i like to yeah, i too. like trainings like that even though i yeah. i'm a fan of uh, online things with uh fantastic uh, uh canvas tools like miro and uh, mural this is a different thing, being in one room together, having lunch together yeah. and uh, reflect on the subjects in between. Yeah, and we will offer the education both as on site and uh, remotely. Mm -hmm. So the first session was on site and soon we'll offer the remote version as well, of course. Yeah, and we are doing this together with uh, uh, Ekan Consulting and also uh, Beyond Budgeting Roundtable. So, uh, yeah. very excited to deliver this. Uh, I really feel that I would like to dig deeper into uh, the financial model. Uh, mm. Maybe we should continue with the subject uh, at the FICA uh, further on here. But uh, for should, we explain, FICA, should we explain FICA, Daniel? What is the FICA, Swedish FICA? Yes, that's that's a nice one. Maybe we should uh, end with that. So uh, a Swedish FICA is a very cultural thing where we, in in uh, either if you meet your uh, friends and family or at office, when you would like to have a coffee and you are not just taking a coffee, bringing back to your desk, Maybe you would like to stand up or sit down and talk to people. We call that ritual more or less a fika. A proper fika needs to have coffee or tea, uh, something warm to drink. And in the best way, it's also if we have some cinnamon buns or some cake or something, uh, something to eat to it, then it's a proper fika. But uh, coffee yeah. or tea is the mi bare minimum. And... It's uh, an important thing. Usually you can find companies doing this nine o'clock and three o'clock. You can see that people are leaving their desks for, uh, uh, for everything from five minutes to 30 minutes. It depends. Uh, 
Uh, I like to have fika and I think it's also a very good occasion where you start good discussions both to get to know each other a bit better to build psychological safety but I also seen in places where we take decisions during the fika we more or less come to consent during the fika and then it's easy to take mm. the decision afterwards mm. yeah and uh, I heard that one of the uh, I don't remember his name. He he were, used to work for the UN, and uh, he were negotiating in a conflict in the Middle East, and uh, they didn't come to any consensus or consent or any decision at all. And he decided, let's bring a fika into this. And during the fika, mm. they started to talk about each other, who they were, family, and all that. And afterwards, he said. It was so much easier because then it was just not that individual from that country. It was an individual and he had a family and had kids and all that. So they could yeah. easily understand each other that they are more or less driven from the same place. But they come with two different views on things. But they had an easier way to come to consent. So that's why a, a think yeah. is powerful. It could also create yeah. peace. <laughs> yes, I think that's. I don't remember the name of that model, but you know the to 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 build relational depth, which we need to be able to discuss complex matters, right? So the fika really mm. contributes to that. So someone is being open and discussing things privately, personal stuff, and then that openness brings trust, and trust brings additional openness, and then you have this spiral that brings this relational depth, and suddenly mm. when we trust each other, then we can discuss really complex matters because we give each other a bit slack in the discussions and really focus on understanding each other because I know you and I know that you're a nice guy right so I want to understand mm. instead of backing out and resist mm. uh, so that's good mm. so that is um, and our take on Fika then is to bring something I had some coffee today uh, you don't seem to have that then you don't need to improve till next time yeah but yes. we meet for a few minutes and discuss a subject that is of mutual interest. So everyone is welcome. Just mm. join. Um, it's an open and uh, usually fun discussion. <laughs> we'll see you next time. See you. Bye.